Welcome to Fire is Orange, a short story compilation by number one New York Times bestselling author, Scott Segler! Ten titillating tales to tantalize your thoughts. Hello, junkies. Here we are with the final story episode of Fire is Orange, the conclusion to The Hippo. Next week, we have one more episode of Fire is Orange. That is our Q&A episode. Do you have questions or comments about The Hippo, about the GFL, about any Sigler Burst property? Email your questions to info at emptyset.com by January 13th, 2020, and I will respond. You will hear me respond to you live I mean, record it, but I will not have heard your question until we're recording. So it's basically live. If you want to hear your voice on this very podcast, we make that possible. Email an MP3 of your question to info at empty set. But if it's recorded one, keep it concise. We're not going to listen to you blab for 30 seconds or 40 seconds because it's my job to blab for much longer than 40 seconds. So back off! Now, very important news. A few weeks back, I told you we might be ending this podcast, or at least putting it on hiatus. We got a lot of response from the junkies. We got a lot of response from you guys. So a real girl herself and I put our heads together, and we have come up with a plan. After the episode, I will tell you what comes next in the Scott Sigler Audiobooks podcast. But first, it's time for the conclusion of the lovely, touching, heartfelt story, The Hippo. Let me get you caught up. Then we're going to sizzle us up some bacon. Previously on The Hippo, star reporter Yuki has been working on the story of the year. Who is The Hippo and why is he slaughtering vampires in horrible, horrible ways? She finally delivers her report, a tale so shocking it even surprises The Hippo himself and the hippo's best friend, Big Baby. And now, the conclusion of The Hippo. The Report This is Yuki Nitobe reporting live from Oakland, California. I am standing in front of the former house of Harold Chamberlain, one of the change's early victims. What happened here was an unbelievable nightmare involving the death of a six-year-old girl and the destruction of an American family, but that tragic story pales in comparison to what came next and to the shocking revelation of what Chamberlain is now doing to Oakland's vampires. The whole story at eight, right here on Global Satellite News. Yuki lowered the microphone. How'd that look, Corey? Corey lowered his shoulder-held camera. Tip-top, Yuki, and you look hot as hell. Karin fought the urge to slap the man in the back of the head. She had to admit, though, that Corey was right. Yuki had opened her blouse another button, made her eye makeup darker, and put on a shade of purplish-red lipstick that Karin couldn't stop staring at. Yuki waved Karin over. Karin, how do my eyes look? This is a somber report. Too much shadow? Yuki batted those eyes, and Karin's insides melted. Um, they look great. Yuki tipped her head toward the house. And from where Corey is standing, you can't see any of your people, right? Karin smiled a little. It was quite an image Yuki wanted to present, the brave reporter standing alone on the dangerous streets of Oakland in front of a half-burnt-out ranch house, nothing behind her but peeling white paint, broken glass, charred wood, and two equally ruined homes on either side. Off to the left, out of the camera's view, of course, two squads of Academy heavies. Off to the right, two more squads. A grizzly blocked either end of the street, and another, along with a fifth and sixth squad, was on the street behind the house to make sure no unexpected guests came through the backyard. Mid-afternoon, plenty of sun by which to see any threats, and enough firepower to kill anything short of a platoon's worth of organized vamps that made this street about the safest spot east of the Bay Bridge. With those assets off camera, however, the public would see exactly what Yuki wanted them to see, or rather, 
exactly what she didn't want them to see. Yuki was a master of casual manipulation, both visual and verbal, and Karin was already halfway to smitten. Dating Yuki, she knew, would not end well. But it could be a whole lot of fun in the meantime, and you never know what her heart might find. Thirty seconds, Corey called out. Got it, Yuki said to him, then to Karin. You're sure I look good for this? Not good, Karin said. You look just amazing. Yuki smiled. Oh, you're sweet. She reached up and cupped Karin's cheek. The skin felt cool from the afternoon air, yet electrifying at the same time, then gave that same cheek a light pat. Off with you now, Yuki said. It's showtime. Harry Comes Home, Part 2 Harry made sure the remote control was firmly in his hand before he cracked open the food truck's back door. If the old man needed a shock from that collar, that's just the way things were. Dad? No answer. Harry opened the door a little more, held it at arm's length, the remote in his other hand, and held near his hip. Pops? You okay? <laughs> the old man said. Harry opened the doors the rest of the way. Dad was, of course, strapped to the dolly, the brass mask that had recently covered Tavina's face, now where it actually belonged. Dad's eyes were half-lidded. He looked like he needed a nap. His burgeoning belly jutted forth from between the tight straps just above and below it. Dad, you shouldn't have ate so much. <sighs> The old guy was so cute when he was sleepy. Come on, pups, Harry said as he pulled the dolly from between the stove and the sink. Let's get you settled into your new home. The old building had once been a warehouse, then a transmission shop, then something to do with motorcycles, Harry wasn't sure. Whoever had owned it wasn't around anymore, obviously, nor were the people who had stored their vehicles here. All victims of the first round of violence, probably. There were several non-running trucks inside, along with a couple of boats covered by tight, dusty tarps. The food truck fit nicely between some rich dude's Chris Craft and a rust-eaten delivery truck with a faded Frito-Lay logo on the side. The building was cold and drafty. Not as nice as the school, but it was safe, probably, and that was enough. Harry rolled the dolly through an open, heavy fire door. Maybe this room had once been used for painting cars. Now it was Dad's room. Harry set the dolly upright. Up above, attached to a ceiling girder, was a winch spooled with steel cable. Harry pulled a second remote from a coat pocket and pressed a button. The winch hummed to life, lowered the cable down like an industrial spider just starting a web. He clipped the cable to his father's shock collar. This is your new place, Dad. <laughs> Dad said. I hear you, Harry said. Hard day. Same old, same old, am I right? He loosened the dolly's straps. His father managed two steps before sagging down to the concrete floor and immediately falling into a snore-punctuated doze. Harry removed the mask. Sleep well, Dad. I love you. Harry rolled the dolly out of the room and shut the heavy door behind him. Dad was a kook, no doubt about that, but he was family, and family was all that mattered. Harry walked to one of the abandoned vehicles, an old RV. It wasn't a bad setup, really. A bed, a little couch that was almost comfortable, a tiny sink, a small flat-panel TV, and, of course, a working stove and oven. There was also a stall that doubled as both shower and toilet. Getting his bulk into that narrow space was quite a challenge he already knew. He opened the RV door. The smell of baking cupcakes welcomed him like an old friend. He'd put in a batch as soon as he'd arrived. The RV was old and smelled a little funky. The odor of good cooking would drive out that funk, make the small space downright homey. The RV's oven was smaller than the food trucks, but big enough for one batch just twelve cupcakes, enough to last tonight and tomorrow. 
Harry slid off his coat. Thing had to weigh a hundred pounds, at least, what with all the bells and whistles in there. He set the coat over the back of the driver's seat, then drew Big Baby from the custom shoulder holster. Finally, Harry sat his fat ass down on the couch, Big Baby on the cushion next to him. Hell of a day at sea, eh, Harry? Been trying to tell you, Harry said. Oakland's a dangerous place. You did good, Kimasavi. Dad's alive. I'm alive. You took one lousy pellet to the cheek. Other than that, you're fine. Four of those fuck nuggets are dead. Harry nodded, then realized he'd left the batch of cream cheese frosting in the food truck. Ah, screw it. He would get it later. He just needed to rest his bones for a few minutes. He picked up the remote and turned on the TV. The very first image he saw was a KRON special report logo across the bottom. Above it, a ridiculously attractive Asian woman standing in front of... in front of Harry's old house. It was here, just over a year ago, that the change destroyed a family, the woman said. One of many families, to be sure, but this story is still affecting the Bay Area. Here in the East Bay in Oakland, a serial killer is on the loose. When the nation, and indeed the world, is deluged daily with images of death, why is yet another serial killer significant? Because this one isn't a blood. This one hunts bloods, exterminates them as if they were vermin and not people. I warn you, the following images may be too disturbing to see, even for those of you numbed by the nightly parade of death and destruction. The image on the screen changed to the vampire Harry had put down just last night. Serial killer, what's that crazy bitch talking about? Shut up, big baby. The camera showed the open skull, then moved inside the skull. A circle of light played off the already drying red smears inside. Thus far, seven victims have been found, the reporter said, all with the tops of their heads cut off, all with their brains removed, and all appear to have gone through significant physical trauma before death. In short, they were captured, tortured, killed, and then their bodies were mutilated. Harry listened to her, watched her, but only partially. He couldn't stop looking past her to the half-burned house. That bird feeder in the front yard, Harry had put that in himself. While authorities could find nothing about this killer, I, Yuki Nitobe, was able to discover his identity. Serial killer or self-appointed vigilante? We still don't know. What we do know now is his name. Harold Chamberlain. The image changed to a picture of a smiling, handsome black man with blue eyes wearing a police uniform. It took Harry a split second to recognize the man. Sweet Jesus. Big Baby said. Look how skinny you used to be, you big fat fuck. It barely even looks like you. Shut up, Big Baby. Yuki again. This man was a gun collector and member of the Oakland Police Department's SWAT team, highly decorated for his service to the public. What is he now? Perhaps you can decide for yourself. Just look at what Harold Chamberlain does to his victims. The image changed to another vampire Harry had put down, a white woman he'd taken out a week ago. A ragged line of bone bordered the negative space that had once been her upper jaw, the top of her head missing, dried blood flaking off her skin, one eye gone, the other staring out. I remember that one, Big Baby said. She screamed a lot. She did, Harry said. He wondered if all of his work looked that sloppy. Chamberlain was a Marine for eight years, Yuki said. In the Marines, he was a sniper. After he got out, he became a police officer in Oakland, eventually joining the SWAT unit, where he served for another three years until the change. SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. Already armed with lethal skills, Chamberlain received further training as part of the SWAT unit. You were a Marine, no shit. Harry stared at the screen. His thoughts felt out of focus, kind of fuzzy, like he couldn't lock them down, like trying to read a piece of paper someone was waving in front of your face. I wasn't, 
he said. I don't think I was. Yuki turned and walked toward the house, moving slightly sideways so that she could continue to look at the following camera. Chamberlain was a family man, she said. The image on the screen flashed up a picture of a woman. Hispanic, dark complexion, brown eyes, a roundish face etched with laugh lines. Chamberlain married Doris Miraz seven years ago, and four years ago they had a daughter, Rebecca. The image changed again, this time a little girl. Her skin a perfect milk chocolate, but the eyes, the eyes, they blazed blue. The color of a clear sky an hour before the sun sets. Jesus H. Christ, Big Baby said. You had a daughter, man. You never tell me anything. Shut up, Big Baby. Yuki stood at the charred front door. It was in this house that Chamberlain lived with his wife, his daughter, and his father, Alan Chamberlain, locally known as the owner of Bupp's Cups, an Oakland pastry shop. A year ago, police were called to this house because Harold Chamberlain had allegedly murdered his wife and daughter. It was assumed he changed and, as a result, killed those closest to him. Before he could be brought to trial, a wave of violence submerged Oakland in riots and overwhelmed the city government. In this chaos, Harold Chamberlain escaped and has never been heard from again. As for the death of his wife and daughter, I was able to find some pictures of the crime scene on the Internet. Again, the images you are about to see are disturbing in the extreme. If you don't want to see such horrors, please turn away. Oh, she's good, Big Baby said. Milking the drama like that, she's... Harry picked up Big Baby and cocked the hammer in one smooth motion. He pointed the barrel at the TV using both hands this time and fired. The gun leapt. A fist-sized black spot appeared in the screen, haloed by spiderweb cracks. But the slightly darker picture kept playing. These are the images of murder, Yuki said. These show... Harry cocked and fired again. The screen went blank. He cocked and fired again. And again. And again. He cocked the hammer and pulled the trigger. The hammer clicked on empty. Jesus, Big Baby said. Overreact much? Harry tossed the gun forward. It hit the dashboard and fell somewhere in front of the passenger seat. Asshole, Big Baby said, but the revolver's voice sounded far away. Memories rose up in Harry's thoughts, glowing tendrils of recollection, flash bulbs of bits of images he couldn't remember that he had pushed away, pushed down. His daughter, screaming. The taste of blood. A vampire did it, not him. He'd served his country and then his community. He'd protected people against those monsters. It was the vampires that changed. One of them killed his daughter. One of them killed his wife. Not his father. His father could never have done that. Never. The monsters had done it. It was the monsters, the monsters, the monsters had to be punished. It was the monsters, the monsters, they had to be punished. The oven timer beeped. Harry opened his eyes. The cupcakes were done. That was the problem. That was why he felt so fuzzy. Because he hadn't eaten in a long time. He'd feel better after he ate a cupcake or two. Or three. He stood and removed them from the oven, set them on the counter to cool. No, not the cupcakes themselves. He felt fuzzy unless he had that frosting. That special frosting. The food truck. There was a batch of it in the food truck. He only felt right after the frosting. Harry shuffled to the RV's door and stepped out onto the dirty concrete. It wasn't him. It was them, the monsters. He was one of the good guys. He killed monsters. He punished monsters. And now those same monsters, those baby killers, they were organizing, becoming even more dangerous. No. One monster in particular was organizing them. Charlemagne. Harry walked through the dark space toward the food truck. He would have a little snack, a little frosting, get some sleep, 
and then he'd start planning the next mission. Charlemagne had to be punished. That was The Hippo, read by none other than the amazing Ray Porter. As you could tell by listening to the story, it's it's a tale about family. It's loving and touching. Do you have thoughts on The Hippo now that it's done? What did you think? If there's anything you want to communicate to us, send those thoughts to info at EmptySet.com so we can talk about your feels in our Q&A episode next week. they got to be in by January 13th. 2020 to make it into the episode. Now, before this episode, I told you that after the episode, I would tell you all about what's going on with the podcast. So bear with me while I engage in a little thing the vaudevillians used to call holding out for drama. I don't know that they call it that. I'm just saying I'm going to take a long time to get to my point. So crack yourself open a cold one, sit back and chill because I think I have some good news. The problem remains the same in that my time is completely taken up. We we finished up Aliens Phalanx. Uh, By the way, you can pre-order that at scottsigler.com slash phalanx. All the links are there. By the way, hardcover of that is available now too. Um, We're done with Phalanx. It's all in the hands of Titan Books. But we're still working on GFL Book 6, the Gangster. We're still working on The Killer, a great GFL novella written with J.C. Hutchins. And I desperately want to get to the crypt by sometime in 2020. I start working on it sometime in late 2020. We have to get these things done. I promise you these things for many, many years. Which means I'm still slammed. There's no way around it. But we know, we know this podcast is a big part of your week. We know that not to toot our own horn, but we bring in a source of brightness and light into your week. And I'm sure you have many sources of brightness and light. We're not the only source, obviously, but we're one little pinpoint of starlight in a vast black canvas uh, that is your life. My analogy is completely falling apart. We do fun shit and you like our fun shit every week. Let's get back to business. So we want to keep that going for you because we also are a business and this is the best way to stay connected with you. We want to stay connected with you. We want you to know what's going on in our world. We want to give you all the fun information and sometimes the unfun information about what we're going through over here because we know that you getting to know more about the storyteller gives you a certain extra sense of enjoyment with the stories. We want to make sure you know what appearances we have coming out, what books are coming out, all all that good news. We, but we are out of stuff to podcast. I've told you this before. We have no more stories in the hopper. I have nothing that is finished and written and ready to record. I have no audiobooks pending that we can chop up that we haven't given to you before. There's nothing left in the hopper. That's why we thought about putting this on hold. However, however, a real girl herself, and Evo Terra, our podcast consultant extraordinaire, came up with a killer idea on how to keep this cast going until we do have new content to pad- podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, let's jump in the Wayback Machine. Let's go back to 2007, 12 years ago. What was going on in 2007? Well, the very first iPhone was released. The housing bubble burst. Spider-Man 3 was the top-grossing movie of the year. Uh, The movie 300 came out, one of my favorite movies. Peyton Manning and the Colts won the Super Bowl. And a modest, unpublished, devilishly handsome author with a mellifluous voice decided to podcast the novel as he wrote it, writing the story each week, then recording it on Saturday, editing it, and releasing it on Sunday. That author... Ladies and gentlemen, junkies of all ages, that author was me. And that book was called Nocturnal. Now, eventually, Nocturnal was picked up by Crown Publishing. The heavily rewritten final version of Nocturnal was published in hardcover in 2012. What I had podcast before was basically... I was podcasting a rough draft as I wrote it. I did this as an experiment to see how it would go. Turns out, not my style of storytelling, because you can't go back and edit anything after the fact. Once you podcast it and the audience has heard it, 
that's it. That's the story you have to persevere on from there. So it was coming out in 2012, and we knew that, in hardcover. Big fancy deal from Crown Publishing, which is part of Random House. Somewhere around 2011, we pulled the original version in an effort to preserve the final story. Because we knew that uh, if we if we left it up, people were going to find it one way or another. They were going to hear this rough draft and think that was the final version. You know, if they see Nocturnal on a shelf, they go, oh, I'll just go get the audio version. Even if they were to download it from Pirate Bay and other places that rip off our work and give it away for free. I still didn't want people to get the bad version of the book. If you were going to steal it, I wanted you to get the final polished version. Now you, the junkie, were in on it. If you were listening back then, you were in on it. You knew I was podcasting it as I went. We were all in it together. It was a super fun time experiment. I mean, that's how Pookie Chang got to be such a big character because you guys were emailing me after the first couple of episodes saying, please don't kill him. We love him. And of course, he's he's great. And I was able to listen to you and make some changes to the story. So we wanted, But we wanted to get that version down because we wanted the final heavily edited, polished version up. Since then, since we stealth pulled it down, just took it away and didn't tell anybody. We've had many, many people ask us for the original version so that they can have it in their own audio collection, to which we have constantly said, no, uh uh-uh, you can't have it. You can't have it, and we were adamant about it, and we meant what we said, and we told you kids to get off our lawn and said you can't have a podcast. We're taking it to the grave with us, and that is just the way things are. Well, folks, on January 12th, 2020, next week, We are releasing the Fire is Orange Q&A episode. On January 19th, 2020, a real girl herself and I will be putting out the 2019 Year in Review episode. Always a super fun episode. People dig those. Make sure you tune in for that. We'll tell you about all the stuff that we did in 2019. And then on Sunday, January 26th, 2020, we will release episode one of the original Nocturnal podcast. You are going to hear a massive change, both in, I think, vocal performance and definitely in sound quality, because I had a completely different rig back then, and of course, in the story, because you're were, you were, you were getting that one on the fly. A lot has changed in the past 12 years. We think this is going to be a ton of fun. We have some other features lined up for this cast, but we can't tell you about those yet. We will tell you later. Got to keep you teased out just a little bit. Nocturnal was really a game changer for us, as 2007 was the year I signed my five-book deal with Crown Publishing. We were able to put out Infected, and I believe that a big part of that deal was the publishing world waking up to podcasts and social media and online content and seeing all the insanity that was going on over at scottsigler.com, where all of the junkies were hanging out in the forums and trading comments on all the episodes. And we had, you know, we had 14,000 active users on the thing back then. It was, it was a big deal before Facebook came and uh, killed all websites, frankly. So I think that Crown saw what was going on at scottsdale.com and they thought there, there's something we don't understand going on here, but this guy can build up his own audience and we want to be in business with them. And they signed me to that five book deal. So Nocturnal is part of uh, all me going full time. It's part of all the books that you have heard since then. So we're super excited to bring it to you again. So this isn't a new original story, but doing this will let us keep communicating with you every Sunday as we have done for a long, long time. When the 42 episode behemoth that is Nocturnal is finished, we will have hopefully copious amounts of new stuff and get back into the weekly release of brand new stories. That is our plan. We will be back next week with the Q&A of Fire is Orange. And until then, we will talk to you all real soon, at least for the rest of 2020. Good day, sir. Good day, ma'am. You have been listening to Fire is Orange. A short story compilation by number one New York Times bestselling novelist, Scott Sigler. Narrated by Scott Sigler, Ray Porter, and A. Kovacs. Produced by A. Kovacs. Engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2019, Empty Set Entertainment. All rights reserved. 
For more information about the author, visit scottsigler.com. Theme music by the band Amps and Volts.